So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, we meet uh, this morning to uh, uh, have, a, have a brief <clears throat> overview of uh, the angiographic projections that we tend to use in uh, congenital heart disease uh, when we take patients to the cath lab for diagnostic uh, or interventional uh, cardiac catheterization. Um, so, I think before we actually go on to the uh, the angios, uh, it's important to understand the terminology. So, uh, as you're all aware, those of you who have uh, been in the cath lab, uh, there are certain terms that we use um, frequently to describe the various angiographic views. Um, so, these the, the, the common projection that we uh, use is the frontal projection uh, or the uh, PA projection. Now, the important factor to remember is the positioning of the X-ray tube. So, uh, you know this, that uh, we have a, a C-shaped arm called the C-arm. Um, at one end of the C-arm, you have the X-ray unit, which produces the X-rays. At the other end, you have the image intensifier, which actually receives the uh, image uh, once, it has, once the X-rays have passed through the patient. So, um, the X-ray in a frontal view, the X-ray is produced underneath the table um, and the image intensifier is actually on top of the patient. This is something that not many of us know when we are in training uh, because uh, the X-ray unit is hidden. So, the X-ray unit is actually beneath the patient. This is the X-ray unit on this picture and this is the image intensifier. Okay, now uh, this C arm can be moved, uh, you know, uh, around, uh, 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 you know, almost a, a 360 degree uh, clock, uh, so to speak, okay, into various positions. So, if you, in this uh, image on the uh, right hand side, uh, the patient is lying on the uh, table and you are standing at the foot end of the patient, okay. So, this is the right of the patient. This is the left of the patient. So, uh, depending on the angulation of the uh, CR, you get various views uh, which are ta termed uh, the oblique views. So, you have the right anterior oblique view uh, when you have the image intensifier, uh, which is cl close to the right shoulder of the patient, and you have the left anterior oblique view when you have the image intensifier close to the left shoulder of the patient. Now, when the left anterior oblique view is taken even more leftward, uh, then you get the lateral view. Lateral view is where this is the, usually, traditionally, the lateral view is the left lateral view, where the image intensifier is actually uh, at 90 degrees to the frontal view um, and to the left of the patient, okay? So, these are the oblique angulations that you can rotate the uh, C arm through. Uh, to get various oblique projections. Now, uh, you must understand that the heart is actually positioned within the chest in an oblique manner. To, uh, so, to interrogate uh, some of the structures, um, you have to get into oblique projections. And often, you have to get more than one projection <clears throat> in order to uh, get a complete idea of the structure that you're trying to image. Now, um, as you're aware, the, uh, you know, Angiography is more of a, a two-dimensional technique, unlike perhaps CT or MRI, uh, where you get more complete imaging information. And this is one of the reasons why, obviously, diagnostic angiography is not really a, a preferred technique today. And often, angiography is used uh, more as a, a preliminary step to intervention. So. Um, many of the diagnostic studies uh, in the current day and age are done by using non-invasive techniques. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, you know, now uh, techniques to uh, measure, assess the hemodynamics, including the pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary pressures, um, using MRI, et cetera, which are used widely abroad. Uh, of course, because of non-availability of resources, um, you know, both financial and human resource, um, in India, we are still uh, using uh, cardiac catheterization as a primary modality of, uh, di you know, uh, diagnostic, advanced diagnostic imaging in many centers. Uh, but that is gradually staying, is changing, particularly for structural studies, 
uh, CT and MRI are increasingly being used, okay? But um, going back to our projections, obviously, we talked about, sorry, we talked about the uh, various oblique projections, um, which is the right and left anterior obliques, and of course, the frontal and the lateral projection. Um, the C arm can also be tilted. So not only can it be rotated into the oblique projection, it can also be tilted. So you can have a cranial tilt and you can have a caudal tilt. So the, during the cranial tilt, the image intensifier moves towards the head of the patient. During the caudal tilt, the image intensifier moves towards the foot of the patient. So uh, these terminologies you have to get familiar with. And just as a, as a clue or a guide, remember that um, the uh, projections are with reference to the image in intensifier. So if the uh, image intensifier uh, moves to the right of the patient, it is uh, RAO. If it moves to the left of the patient, it is LAO. And then again, if it moves towards the head of the patient, it's cranial. If it moves towards the foot of the patient, it's caudal. Okay? So just uh, to help you with ease of remembering. But, I, you know, the more you use these techniques in the lab, the more familiar and the more natural this will become to you. So um, if you are the operator uh, in a case in the, in the cat lab, um, it is your responsibility uh, overall to ensure patient safety, uh, staff safety, and equipment safety, okay? So um, before even you, you know, putting your hands on the patient uh, or commencing a technique, it is important uh, to understand certain basic concepts, okay? So uh, cardiac catheterization, although we do it very casually, particularly diagnostic catheterization, uh, is not something to be taken lightly. There is a, a radiation involved, um, and it is important to understand the underlying basic concepts of trying to use as little radiation as possible, uh, not only for the safety of the patient. Often our patients are chronic patients and complex patients, and they keep coming back to the lab. Uh, so they have repeated exposure to uh, radiation, and this can have an impact uh, on their future health. Uh, so it is important for us to be uh, always, uh, you know, aware and, uh, you know, cognizant of this um, and uh, to try and take all precautions possible. Uh, the first, uh, you know, question to ask ourselves is whether this study is necessary at all. Can we get this information using... Uh, you know, maybe just echocardiography or, or an image uh, imaging technique like uh, MRI, perhaps, which doesn't involve radiation. And once we have convinced ourselves that the patient does need the study, then, of course, uh, we have to plan the study in such a way that we uh, complete it uh, swiftly. Uh, there is no need to take unnecessary angiograms. Uh, so we have to restrict the number of angiograms to the areas of interest uh, or the key key areas uh, that we are looking to get information about. Uh, in this way, we avoid unnecessary, unnecessary angiography. Uh, the other way, of course, of uh, safeguarding patient safety is to use the imaging equipment uh, optimally uh, so that there is uh, less pay, uh, dose to the patient um, and uh, less radiation to the patient. So apart from the patient, of course, the staff are very important. Uh, cat lab staff are exposed to radiation day in and day out, uh, and it is the responsibility of the operator to ensure that uh, you are not exposing them unduly. Firstly, they need to be protected. Uh, they need to be aware of the dangers of radiation. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have to perhaps do workshops or, uh, you know, uh, classes once in a way to educate particularly the newer members of your uh, cat lab team. Uh, then, uh, they have to wear their protective uh, lead uh, gear. Uh, and it is the uh, responsibility of the operator to ensure that everybody in the room has got protective uh, lead gear on, okay? Um, and then the way, of course, using the equipment optimally, uh, so avoiding unnecessary angiograms, uh, reducing the distance between the image intensifier and the patient, this reduces the scatter of radiation, uh, then collimating the image, uh, trying to... Um, you know, kind of use perhaps uh, biplane if you have the option to do it rather than doing the repeated angiograms. So these are some of the measures that you can take to uh, reduce the radiation exposure 
not only to the patient, but also to the staff. And of course, last but not least, equipment safety. So the equipment that we have in the cath lab is very expensive. Um, and um, whilst uh, doing your angiography, you will be moving the gantry uh, extensively. Uh, so uh, you have to make sure that, the, that it, this is done safely. Uh, sometimes you have the anesthetic machine next to the patient. So make sure that you don't knock down the anesthetist uh, because you need them. Uh, or damage the anesthesia equipment. So communication is very important, letting people know that they're going to move the, uh, the CR uh, and asking them, asking them to uh, move out of the way and to move their equipment out of the way is important. So these are uh, your core responsibilities. Of course, the angiogram is, uh, you know, is the next step. But prior to doing the angiogram, these are all the various steps that you should take um, to ensure safety in the cat lab. Okay. Now, uh, also, you have to pay attention to patient positioning. I'm sure you're all well aware. Um, it's uh, very key to getting good angiographic views, particularly in children, and especially if you're doing it only under sedation. Okay, so uh, I'm sure all of you have your unique techniques. So often uh, there is a, a board uh, which we place under the hip of the patient. Uh, each unit has its own customized board. This allows us to secure the hip of the patient uh, onto the uh, surface, uh, and then we use various methods to secure the limb uh, so that the patient does not move to, during the study. Again, remember before starting the study to uh, raise the arm of the patient, particularly if you're planning to do lateral views or uh, uh, oblique views, uh, so that uh, the arms are raised above the head and secured. Because midway through the study, it is really awkward uh, and it can potentially desterilize your sterile field if you have to then change the position of the patient, okay? So patient posi positioning is very important. Next, we come to collimation. We have already mentioned this. Um, so the idea is to uh, make your field of uh, interest as small as possible uh, so that you cut out the unnecessary bits that you don't need to look at. So like, for example, the arms, the jaw, you know, the abdomen, these, these areas where uh, you may not have any interest, uh, try not to expose them to radiation. So the collimation basically shields these areas from radiation. And we've already talked about staff radiation. So positioning of the image intensifier close to the patient is important. Using protective shields. So you have these uh, uh, mobile shields in the cat lab that you can use. So those can be used close to the patient and also uh, you know, kind of advise the staff, uh, again, standing very close, unless they have to, uh, you know, ask them not to stand very close to the uh, C arm, uh, and also to move away, particularly when you're doing your uh, acquisitions. Um, so these are some of the simple measures that you can take. Uh, as far as the dose delivery is concerned, uh, magnification, use of magnification, uh, increases the dose delivered to the patient. So try and avoid magnification unless you really need to. Um, so uh, I don't really use mag very often uh, because mainly because of this, um, you know, this issue. Sometimes for measurements you may need to use it, but uh, I generally try and tend to avoid it. Um, and then of course uh, try and do for, a, for prolonged procedures, particularly intervention procedures, example, say collateral occlusion or something like that. Uh, try and avoid, uh, you know, acquisitions and try and just do pleural captures. Uh, of course, acquisitions give you better quality. So in certain situations, uh, acquisitions are uh, much better. Uh, but particularly when you're doing uh, multiple angiograms as part of an interventional procedure, just do pleural grabs instead of acquisitions. That way you reduce your radiation dose. So these are all the various ways to uh, try and... Uh, you know, uh, decrease the amount of radiation in the cat lab. Uh, we've already talked about this, about contrast usage to minimize the number of angiograms. You should have a plan in your mind before you go into the cat lab as to what you're actually looking for. Do, don't go on a fishing expedition. I think in the, in the olden days where we had, uh, you know, fewer imaging modalities and angiography was perhaps one of the only imaging modalities, it was fine to go to every chamber, get every pressure, you know, do lots of angiograms. But in, in today's practice, uh, we get a lot of information from non-invasive imaging. So uh, you are going there with a specific question that you want to answer. 
So you try and answer that specific question and get out. And don't, uh, you know, kind of uh, keep taking angiograms in every chamber and try and get pressures and saturations in every chamber. Uh, they are often of very little additional value, okay? And you're unnecessarily exposing the patient to radiation, prolonging your procedure, increasing the possibility of complications. Okay, so uh, then of course, accurate catheter positioning is very important. So always check before you inject. Uh, you can do test injection. Uh, this is not only to, uh, to uh, determine the position of the catheter, but also the safety of the catheter. So if you, uh, you can, by doing a small test shot, you can make sure that the catheter is not wedged into some tissue, uh, which can lead to staining and problems. Uh, so you can make sure that the tip of the catheter is free. You can also make sure that, for example, if you're trying to get an image of a PDA for closure, um, you know, sometimes positioning the, the pigtail and the iota can be a little tricky. Um, so you can uh, take, do a little test shot to make sure that you're in the right position. So uh, this way you avoid unnecessary angiogram. So if you, if you are too distal, for example, in a PDA, you will not catch it. And then you have to repeat the angiogram. That's an unnecessary exposure uh, of and, and uh, contrast administration. Of course, uh, you have to ensure adequate uh, hydration and, uh, um, and diuresis. Uh, you see very often, uh, you know, if, if you don't have good systems in place in your, uh, in your unit, uh, that the patients are not hydrated adequately they, or they are fasted for too long. So they come to the lab and uh, they are often, uh, you know, they have some baseline acidosis. This not only interferes with your hemodynamics, uh, but also the lack of, uh, you know, hydration uh, can predispose them to co contrast-related complications. I think we have discussed this in our uh, one of our previous talks. So hydration is very important. So prehydrate the patient. And if you have ended up using a lot of contrast in a study, uh, you know, make sure you give enough or extra fluid and maybe a dose of diuretic. Calibration and measurement, uh, of course, it's each, each uh, you know, uh, imaging system will have its own calibration uh, uh, inbuilt. Uh, the calibration systems, which are automatic, are much better uh, and more accurate than the ones where you have to go and calibrate using, a, uh, you know, using the French measurement of a catheter. The newer angiography systems have uh, inbuilt uh, calibration techniques, uh, but the older ones that many of our units still have, um, you know, rely on the operator manually calibrating based on the angiographic catheter. But always pay attention to the calibration. For example, if you're using, a, you can use things like marker pigtails in the older patients, uh, which give more accurate calibration. But you have to know, you know, what points to measure from. So it will always be distal to distal or proximal to proximal. So you have to just make sure which, which end of the marker you're measuring from. These are all small details, uh, but it is your responsibility to have this knowledge uh, before you embark on a procedure. Okay, so now the rest of the talk really is going to be pretty practical. I really hope these videos work. I had some problem with my video software yesterday, so I had to convert uh, all the videos um, yesterday. Uh, but hopefully it's done the job. So uh, we will try and look at the optimal views for the various structures that we normally look at uh, in the cath lab and, uh, and see how, um, you know, um, how the changing the views helps us to, to visualize certain uh, structures better, okay? Um, this is going to be a very practical talk. There's not really that much theory. Um, there is a, another talk on our, um, uh, you know, database the, uh, on YouTube. Uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Nageshwar Rao's talk. Uh, um, so that would be a, a useful, um, you know, additional tool along with this. Uh, so you can probably watch that as well, uh, you know, together with this lecture. Uh, and hopefully that will give you a, a complete comprehensive uh, ideas about angiographic views that, uh, in congenital heart disease. Okay, anyway, so one of the, uh, you know, the, the, the first things that we look at in our systematic approach is situs determination. Okay, so um, what is the view? Now we'll have a little bit of interaction. Okay, what is the view that you think um, is the most commonly used for determining situs? Anybody? <clears throat> 
what is the most exactly so frontal okay the frontal view which is the uh, the uh, the plain kind of posterior anterior uh, view is the one that is most commonly used for determining situs so uh, can you see this angiogram clearly enough on your screen yes or no can you see this angiogram clearly enough on your screen yes good so uh, okay what so can you can you describe this angiogram with particular reference to the situs okay situs and uh, you know the cardiac position in situs so what is this what is this patient got correct so there is a uh, dextrocardia <coughs> so uh, in the frontal we're looking at this this um, uh, frontal angiogram and the injection is in a so if you look at the injection is in a in the which which structure is the injection being done in svc and uh, if you look at the course of the catheter Uh, below the diaphragm it runs to the right of the spine okay uh, in the ivc and straight up through the ra into the svc so uh, this is uh, a patient with dextrocardia and situs dextrocardia and situs what 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 is the situs of this patient most likely solitus correct okay so uh, this is another uh, angiogram and this patient also has dextrocardia but if you uh, pay attention to the root of the uh, catheter below the level of the diaphragm the catheter is running to the left of the spine okay um so exactly so this is dextrocardia inverses uh the catheter is in the uh, right sided svc it looks like this patient has got bilateral svcs with a uh, connecting vein in between uh, but here the uh, the situs appears to be inverse of course uh, the best way would be to have um, you know perhaps two injections one in the iota and one in the ivc but once again this may be information that you get by echocardiography um, so there may be no need for you to Uh, you know to do this kind of a, a simultaneous angiogram in the iota and the ivc uh, apart from for uh, from for academic purposes okay so uh, this is our uh, next angiogram so just uh, staying on the on the subject of uh, situs what the position what is the position of this uh, you know this catheter with reference to the spine it seems to be in a this is the spine it seems to be in a what position middle yeah mid line position okay and the liver seems to span across the abdomen okay so uh, this is a patient with uh, situs ambiguous uh, so this is dextrocardia and situs ambiguous let's see if i can move to the next one. okay that's good so uh, with reference to situs estimation the best view that you can opt for is a frontal plane or a simple uh, you know posterior anterior um, uh, view okay and uh, we looked at uh, three patients all of them had dextrocardia one had solitus one had inverses and the other had ambiguous so next we move on to the systemic venous anatomy so systemic venous anatomy once again for systemic venous anatomy the best view what is the best view to look at systemic venous anatomy yeah this as uh, once again is the frontal plane so very straight forward and simple uh, because the uh, svc and ivc run along the uh, you know along the spine uh so the so the best uh, way to look at it is using the frontal view so this angiogram we have already seen this is the patient with dextrocardia and situs solitus and this injection is into the right sided svc so you can see how the svc is demonstrated clearly there's a small interconnecting vein 
we are not clearly able to see the left-sided SVC, but it appears that there is one, okay? So uh, this is a, a patient. Ca can you describe the root of this catheter? Anybody, can you describe the root of this catheter? Okay, so the IVC is to the right of the spine. Okay, so this is a, a cytosolitis. Um, so it enters the RA and it appears to run within uh, uh, you know, a coronary sinus from what I can see and into the left-sided SVC. So this is the LSVC, coronary sinus. And if you look at the dye, it runs within the coronary sinus and then opens into the RA, okay? So the RA is on the right side here. Uh, and this is situs uh, charlottes, uh, but there is a left-sided uh, SVC here and dye then flows through the coronary sinus. So you have to be a little careful with these patients. Sometimes the catheter forces within the, you can often enter the coronary sinus and then engage the left SVC. So uh, one of the other techniques that is useful when looking at um, systemic venous anatomy is uh, panning, okay? So for example, here you are trying to look at the, uh, the IVC uh, drainage uh, you uh, one uh, of course you can have a catheter in the IVC, uh, but sometimes you can just inject from the femoral vein itself and then move the table uh, so that you grab the entire sequence of venous drainage. So uh, what do you see here? What does this injection demonstrate? What does this injection demonstrate? Correct. So here you have IVC interruption and a continuation of the, who says normal drainage? This is not normal drainage, right? So uh, you, this is the IVC. Normally it should enter the right atrium. Instead, it doesn't enter the right atrium. So it is interrupted and it continues as the as I was uh, into the right SVC. Now, uh, if it runs to the left of the uh, spine, it is, it is called the hemi as I was, it is, you know, from the hemi as I was system. Uh, on the right of the spine, it is the as I was system. So uh, this is not normal. This is an interrupted IVC with as I was continuation into the right uh, SVC. Okay, so we've had a look at the systemic venous drainage. Uh, we said that the most useful view is just sticking to a plain frontal view. Next, we move on to the uh, pulmonary venous anatomy. So tell me some of the views that are useful to look at pulmonary veins. What are the common views? What are the views that are useful? Anybody? Okay. So... Um, Sometimes just a plain frontal is fine, okay? Uh, so particularly when you don't have uh, overlap, uh, for example, uh, perhaps you're, correct, perhaps you're just injecting into a pulmonary artery, uh, so then you're waiting for the levophase, so you have to get a prolonged acquisition, so you're waiting for the levophase to happen. Uh, so one of the first structures to fill in, or the first structure to fill in on the levophase will be the uh, left atrium through the pulmonary veins. So there will be nothing superimposing on it. So just a plain frontal will be adequate. Um, occasionally when you're doing, when you're looking for pulmonary vein stenosis or planning to do an intervention on the pulmonary vein, you need more accurate, uh, clearer views of the pulmonary vein. Uh, and in that situation, uh, you, would, you may want to go into uh, oblique projections. Uh, LAO is a very useful projection. Uh, for pulmonary venous anatomy and occasionally lateral can also be useful because the pulmonary veins are posterior. Uh, so it can be useful uh, for you to visualize these posterior structures. Okay. Uh, also, there are various uh, ways or methods of uh, 
showing or highlighting pulmonary veins. So uh, here, what has happened is that the, the uh, catheter is directly engaged in the pulmonary vein. It has actually been wedged and it is being used to, uh, to delineate the pulmonary artery. Uh, but so therefore, it's a little distal to look at the pulmonary veins. But if you look at the very initial phases of the injection, I'll try and freeze it when it happens, okay? So the catheter is inside the pulmonary vein here. So this is the uh, pulmonary vein. And then it backfills because it is wedged, it fills, uh, you know, backfills the pulmonary artery. But uh, so we can, if there is a PFO or an atrial uh, opening, uh, then it is possible to directly engage the pulmonary vein. This has been done just in plain frontal uh, and you can see that this patient has got extracardia. Also, you can see that it's a post-operative patient, okay? Uh, then we move on. Here uh, is, a, is another patient. Uh, what is going on here? Very common kind of a, a spotter diagnosis showing some very typical findings. What is going on here? Anybody? We have to be quick. We have uh, the rest of the heart to go through. Okay. So, uh, okay. I'm getting different. Okay. So somebody says vertical vein, uh, which is correct. So this is your catheter that is going up the IVC into the right atrium and into the SVC. You note that the SVC is hugely dilated, okay? This is the innominate vein, and this is your vertical vein, okay? So this is that typical, if you look at just the cardiac silhouette, this is that snowman uh, sign or figure of eight. Uh, so this is a patient with TAPVC, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection with a vertical vein into the innominate vein, and then into a dilated SVC. So here, uh, the uh, pul the uh, pulmonary venous pathway has been directly entered. Now, if this catheter is advanced further uh, downwards, you can actually locate, using a wire, you can locate each of the veins uh, and engage them if you, if you need to do that, okay? So, uh, the other technique of highlighting pulmonary veins, like we discussed a little earlier. So we have talked about uh, two techniques where we directly engage the pulmonary vein. Either, you know, in the first case, we went through the atrial septum and entered the pulmonary vein. In the second case, this was a, a case of anomalous uh, pulmonary venous connection. So we uh, went through the uh, SVC itself and entered the vertical vein. And then we can uh, further downwards, uh, we can enter uh, or further proximally or distally, whatever it is, we can enter the pulmonary veins individually, okay? Now, the other way of showing the pulmonary veins is actually by looking at the levo phase of a, a pulmonary angiogram, okay? So, uh, can you identify what is going on here? Correct. I think somebody's already, I don't know whether this answer for, is for this question or the next question. So, uh, I mean, or for the previous question, but here you see that there is a pigtail catheter in the right ventricular outflow tract and uh, pulmonary, pulmonary artery. Uh, so, the important thing here, obviously, is to get a long acquisition. Oops, so easy. Okay, let's go back. Let's hope we get this back. Yeah. So, the important thing is to get a long acquisition. Okay. So, you wait for the lead. Okay, so this is very nice. So this is the injection of the pulmonary artery. Wait, keep going. Now the pulmonary veins are filled in, okay? So the pulmonary veins are filling in here. And instead of entering the uh, left atrium, uh, they are all forming a confluence. There is a vertical vein that goes into the innominate and then drains back via the, you can see that draining back via the uh, SVC. So this is another example of a, a supracardiac TAPVC, but here we have used a different technique to demonstrate the supracardiac TAPVC. This is by uh, pulmonary artery angiogram. 
and then uh, a prolonged acquisition for a levo phase. Okay. So um, here, what is happening is that there is um, injection into the which pulmonary vein are we injecting into here? In this angiogram, um, uh, sorry, pulmonary artery. So this is an injection into a pulmonary artery branch. So which branch is it? Yeah, it is in the RPA and it appears to be into the right lower pulmonary artery, okay? Now, um, if you notice, what, what kind of a, a catheter are we using here? We are using a, what kind of a catheter is this? It's not, ah, correct, somebody said swan. This is not a right coronary artery catheter. So if you notice, there is a, tip, a balloon at the tip of this catheter. Can you see it? So this is a balloon tip catheter. And you notice that the dye is coming out of the distal port. So there are no side holes. There is only an end hole. So this is a swan gans catheter. If it was a Berman catheter, there would be no end hole and there would be side holes. So in this angiogram, uh, what we're trying to do is we're selectively trying to inject into this right lower lobe branch. Okay, and initially, uh, you notice that the dye just stands still. So why do you think that is? Why do you think that dye just stands still? So normally, the dye moves, right? Why is it not moving? What is happening here? Anybody? Um, wedge. Okay, so what is happening here is that the balloon actually completely, correct, somebody said obstructed, completely obstructs the branch of the pulmonary artery. So there is no forward flow. So blood has to flow in to wash out the contrast, right? So because the balloon has completely obstructed that branch, the, there is stasis of that contrast in the distal branches. So once at the right at the end, as the balloon is deflated, so let's stop it there and then move it slowly. The balloon is deflated right at the end, okay? And the contrast just disappears, whoosh. But what I want you to pay attention to, fine. So this is another technique uh, of trying to selectively look at so, uh, the, uh, you know, the pulmonary venous drainage of a particular segment, okay? And um, I'd like you to pay attention to exactly what happened here. So. Uh, we are looking at the pulmonary venous drainage. We have entered the pulmonary artery branch, uh, which here is the right lower branch. And then we want to look at the pulmonary venous drainage. So now we are in the levo phase. And normally you would expect the uh, pulmonary vein to drain into the left-sided atrium. But here if you pay careful attention, you will see that in in the final stages of the angiogram, you will see filling on the right side in the IVC. You will, if you keep an eye here, you will see that the uh, IVC region will show some dye. See that? And then the right atrium, okay? So this is a, a patient in whom there is anomalous drainage of the right lower pulmonary vein, okay? And what is this often associated with? What syndrome? when you have exactly. So often these patients will also have anomalous arterial supply to that segment, and this syndrome is called scimitar syndrome. <clears throat> okay? Right, so um, we, this is just, uh, you know, what we talked about uh, initially, uh, that is uh, when we are just looking at the pulmonary veins in a very, uh, you know, standard or uh, cursory way, uh, here it's a selective injection into the RPA. Uh, you can just uh, prolong the acquisition will show you the pulmonary veins. This is just in a frontal plane. And you see the pulmonary veins filling in into the left-sided atrium, okay? This is the atrial septum that you see here. This will be the RA. This will be the RA. 
but you see that the veins are draining normally into the left-sided atrium. So um, the most common view that is used for coronary venous anatomy is actually just a plain frontal view, but you can use various techniques uh, to delineate the pulmonary veins. Either you can directly enter the pulmonary veins if you're able to through the atrial septum, or if it's an anomalous venous channel, you can enter the pulmonary veins uh, through the vertical vein, uh, you know, and into the individual veins, or you can obtain views of the pulmonary veins by a prolonged acquisition of the limo phase after a pulmonary artery angiogram, like we have seen uh, in the last two cases. Uh, if you want to selectively look at the pulmonary venous drainage of a particular segment, then you engage the uh, specific branch of the pulmonary artery and you inject selectively into that branch. Sometimes you can use this kind of a balloon tip technique uh, to get a, a better angiogram, okay? Uh, like we mentioned, when you're doing a pulmonary vein intervention, uh, the LAO view can sometimes be uh, useful. Okay. So uh, next we move on to the atrial septum. Uh, it is very, uh, you know, unusual for us to want to do angiography to look at the atrial septum. Uh, I think the times that we uh, do that are uh, perhaps when you're trying to do an atrial septal puncture, you can do a hand injection to, to outline the septum. So uh, mostly nowadays we use techniques uh, like the transesophageal echocardiography. And usually when we are concerned about the atrial septum, it is because we are trying to close a hole, okay? So what I will do is I will use, uh, uh, you know, patients with uh, ASD to demonstrate uh, the, the lie of the atrial septum uh, on the various projections. So uh, this is a patient who is uh, uh, undergoing an ASD device closure. Uh, you can see that uh, the T probe is down here. Uh, the device has been, uh, you know, kind of delivered, but it hasn't been released. Uh, and uh, here there is an angiogram that is being done in the pul pulmonary artery. So it is a selective uh, left pulmonary artery angiogram. You can see the pulmonary veins filling in, filling in and then the left atrium uh, filling in. Uh, this is being done because of the unusual uh, kind of position of the atrial septum on the uh, frontal plane. Perhaps there is a little bit of tension because of the cable as well, but there are many times when the atrial septum looks very awkward on the frontal plane. Uh, and I normally don't use the frontal plane as my uh, guide to tell me whether a, a device is in good position or not. Uh, and the more useful projection um, I find is the LAO. So here uh, there is a, a LAO and a bit of cranial. Perhaps just about 15 LAO, 15 cranial, something like that. So shallow LAO cranial. Uh, and here you see the, the device uh, in much better position. This is the lie of the septum. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, the separation of the uh, two discs. That is what you're looking for. Uh, if the discs are separated, it means that they are holding on to tissue between them. And you can see perfect positioning of the device here. Okay. Uh, so for the atrial septum, a very good view is actually the uh, left uh, LAO cranial, a shallow LAO cranial. Uh, sometimes for patients with spontan who have had extracardiac conduits, uh, depending on the position of conduit placement in, uh, at your center, uh, a view that is useful is the RAO view. So maybe 20 RAO or 30 RAO can be used to uh, look for spontan fenestration when you're trying to close them or to assess them. Okay, so this is with regards to the atrial septum. Okay, so then we move on to the uh, left ventricle. Uh, we don't really assess the AV valves using uh, angiography. That is done better using echocardiography nowadays. Uh, so as far as LV angiography is concerned, uh, one of the common views that we use is the, uh, the left anterior oblique view. Uh, this is a picture that you find in many textbooks. And basically, uh, it shows you the, uh, the cardiac silhouette um, in the various uh, left anterior oblique projection. So this is just plain frontal. In plain frontal, you see that the majority of the cardiac shadow is actually to the left of the spine uh, and with very little to the right of the spine. Okay, so the more and more LAO you go, the heart shifts. Uh, so this is um, shallow LAO, okay, and this is steep LAO. And then you finally have lateral where the cardiac silhouette is completely separated from the spine. So there is no superimposition on the spine. So in shallow LAO, 
about a third uh, to 50% of the, uh, the cardiac silhouette is shifted uh, to the right of the patient. Uh, and then when you have steep LAO, about two thirds of the cardiac silhouette is shifted to the right of the patient. The other thing you also see is uh, the, uh, the effect of the cranial angulation. So these are uh, LAO with cranial. And you see that the diaphragm uh, is also elevated. So this is without cranial, diaphragm is flat. Um, and as you uh, introduce cranial along with the left anterior oblique, uh, so you see that the, uh, there is a superimposition of the cardiac silhouette on the diaphragm, and the diaphragm appears to be elevated. Uh, this is a, a reference picture. This shows a catheter that has been introduced from the IVC into the RA, through the PFO into the LA, into the LV. Uh, and this would be the uh, respective position of the catheter as you see it on the screen in these various projections. So this is in frontal projection, this is in shallow LAO, this is in steep LAO, and this is in lateral. Uh, so this just gives you an idea as to what happens uh, to the left ventricle and the interventricular septum. So in uh, plain frontal, you can see that uh, the interventricular septum is not clearly outlined. Uh, and as you go into LAO projections, this is the IVS, interventricular septum, and you can see how it gets more lengthened uh, the, the steeper LAO you go. Uh, and that is why this is one of the, uh, the favorite views for visualizing uh, ventricular septal defects, particularly when you're thinking of closing them, okay? So um, we all know the various parts of the ventricular septum. Uh, so you have, of course, the inlet septum, uh, the trabecular septum, and the outlet septum. Uh, and of course, you have the perimembranous area of the septum. Uh, so depending on the position of the VSD uh, on the ventricular septum, uh, various projections are used accordingly. Like I told you, the most common and useful projection would be the LAO cranial, uh, and because that lengthens the septum out and the perimembranous uh, VSD can be clearly seen on this projection. Uh, for muscular VSDs, the lateral projection can sometimes be useful. Uh, for Outlet VSDs or subpulmonary VSDs, the RAO projection is often uh, referred. Okay, so there's just some guides as to um, the various projections that are used. Uh, this picture just gives you more clearly the position of the uh, VSDs. So here you have the perimembranous VSD, uh, you have the uh, posterior muscular uh, VSD, the inlet muscular. These are all the various muscular uh, um, VSDs, inlet muscular, the mid-muscular, trabecular muscular, um, and then the outlet muscular VSDs. And these, this is the uh, juxta arterial uh, VSD or the doubly committed VSD. Uh, so this is best seen in a right anterior oblique projection. This is better seen in a left anterior oblique projection. These can be seen on multiple views. Uh, perhaps lateral can help. So uh, depending on the position of the VSD, you choose your views, okay? So this is an angiogram of the left ventricle in steep LAO. So LAO can be classified into shallow LAO, usually with zero to 30 degrees, mid LAO, 30 to 60 degrees, and steep LAO, which is 60 to 90 degrees. Uh, so in steep LAO, uh, you, you notice that the cardiac silhouette is shifted uh, quite a lot to the right of the uh, spine. So uh, the spine is around here. So there is very little superimposition of the, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, cardiac shadow on the spine. So majority of the cardiac silhouette has been shifted to the right. Uh, so this is the paleo. Also, you notice that there is uh, elevation of the diaphragm, and it superimposes on the uh, cardiac silhouette. So this is not only LAO, but also with a significant amount of cranial. So this is probably something like 60 LAO, 30 to 40 cranial, okay? So uh, the pigtail catheter is positioned, uh, comes along the iota and into the LV. Uh, the, uh, the tip of the catheter is at the apex of the LV, so that means that we see the entire uh, uh, left ventricle, uh, and the ventricular septum is very clearly outlined, and we can see that there are no VSEs uh, in this patient, okay? Uh, so this is just an example of a good steep uh, LAO cranial projection. This is not just plain LAO. This is steep LAO with cranial. 
because the diaphragm is elevated and there is superimposition of the uh, cardiac silhouette on the diaphragm. Okay, this is another patient who has had, uh, this is also an LAO projection. This is part of a procedure that is being done. But if you notice, uh, just compare this uh, patient with your previous patient. Uh, so you can see that the diaphragm, diaphragm is elevated. So there is LAO in this patient. So maybe the same 30, 30 to 40 degrees of uh, 30 degrees of LAO. Uh, but the cardiac, this is the spine, and the cardiac silhouette um, is only shifted to a certain uh, extent, okay? So it's not as uh, shifted as the previous uh, angiogram. Uh, so at least about half, nearly 50% of the cardiac silhouette is still uh, to the, um, you know, to the left side, um, and 50% perhaps to the right side. So this is more mid-LAO. So less LAO when compared to the previous angiogram, I'll just show it to you. This is more LAO, okay? This is a spine, and you see that the, uh, the silhouette has shifted uh, quite significantly uh, to, the, to the right, okay? Then, when, like I mentioned earlier, when you're looking at subpulmonary uh, defects, uh, a good projection is the right anterior oblique. Now, in the right anterior oblique, the cardiac silhouette is shifted to the opposite side, okay? Uh, so if you have the spine here, in RAO, I'm talking about when you're looking at the image, okay? The, in RAO, the cardiac silhouette is shifted to this side. In LAO, the cardiac silhouette is shifted to this side, okay? So if you have the spine in the midline. So um, let's use this technique maybe, if it works. So. Okay, this is the spine. So in RAO, this is when you're looking at the image, and this is in LAO. Okay, so here in this patient, you can see this is the spine. This is an RAO projection, and the cardiac silhouette is shifted to the right. Now. The previous projections that we saw, that were the LAO projections, the cardiac silhouette will be shifted to the left. So we'll just go back to, I'll show you that so that you understand. The spine, okay, like I showed you, it's the spine, and the silhouette is shifted, you know, to the, uh, to your left or the patient's right, however you want to remember it. Okay. So, uh, so now we have talked over the last few slides, we have essentially looked at looking at the uh, left ventricle and the interventricular septum. So the take home message as far as the left ventricle is concerned is that uh, for a lot of uh, ventricular septal defects, the LA LAO cranial is a good view, particularly, uh, you know, the perimembranous defects. Uh, for subpulmonary uh, defects or subarterial defects, and outlet defects, uh, the RAO, uh, maybe a 30, 40 RAO may be a good view to look at the uh, subpulmonary defects. Um, and for muscular defects, uh, lateral may provide good uh, imaging, okay? So that's with regard to the, uh, the LV. We also looked at how to recognize whether there is a, this is a left anterior oblique projection or a right anterior oblique projection and how to determine whether there is a cranial tilt or not, okay? Uh, so that's something that you just need to get clearly in your mind so that when you look at an angiogram, you can identify the projection when you're describing the angiogram. So uh, this is a classical, uh, you know, uh, image in an atrioventricular septal defect. It is here more for historical value. Nowadays, uh, we don't really do angiography to diagnose uh, AVSD, but this is a very pretty picture of a, uh, of that goose neck deformity that we see in the left ventricular outflow tract with AVSD. Now, this is a patient with an AVSD in, uh, you know, who had, this is done in which projection is this? This is an LV angiogram. Which projection is this? Very good. So this is an RAO projection. Okay, so this is done. Oh, I've already said that in my slide. <laughs> Fine, but still, uh, you know, this is an RAO projection. You see that the cardiac silhouette is moved to your right or the patient's left, however you want to see it. 
uh, but it's you know to the right of the uh, of the line that you have drawn. Uh, so this is an REO projection. This is the uh, common valve, the AV valve. There's a little bit of regurgitation, but not too much. Uh, you have the uh, narrow left ventricular outflow tract leading to the iota. So this is an REO. Okay. So uh, this is the Uh, same patient, and uh, here you're using, which projection is this? Just look at the angiogram, forget the, the labeling on the, yeah. Not only LAO, what else is there? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, mid LAO. Yeah, there is also cranial. So mid to steep LAO, so I'm not sure exactly what is used here, maybe something like 45 degrees or something like that. Uh, so you can see that there is also cranial because the uh, diaphragm is superimposed on the cardiac cellulite. Okay, so this is LAO cranial. Not frontal, This is that was not frontal, that is LAO cranial. Frontal is just plain AP. Okay, so uh, RV angiogram. Uh, so what is, if I gave you one view to look at the RV, I told you you're doing, you're going to do a, uh, you know, some RV intervention, uh, say a balloon pulmonary valvoplasty. And I told you, you can use only one view to do this. What is the view that you would choose? What is a very useful view? in yes lateral so uh, the lateral is perhaps the most useful view when you're trying to visualize the right ventricular outflow tract and the boundary gap okay uh, of course there are several uh, you know oblique views and and tilted views that you can use so the rv is something that is very versatile many views can give you a lot of information so this is just a plain frontal view you see uh, the rv inlet that there's a small amount of PR, maybe the catheter induced even. Uh, you can see that the uh, catheter is at the uh, is well positioned in the apex of the RV. There is a lot of trabeculation, it appears, in the right ventricle. So there may be some right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, and then you see how the uh, you know the RVOT is being filled up. There is some suggestion of a, a pulmon uh, of a band or muscle band. Uh, so uh, this appears to me to be. Uh, uh, something like a double chambered right ventricle. Uh, of course, the pressure measurements in the proximal uh, chamber are uh, quite important. But here, can you see that there is a, uh, you know, a bar of muscle? Uh, so this is most likely uh, some for creating some form of mid-chamber uh, obstruction in this patient. Okay. But the idea is to show you uh, that the RV can be uh, seen on a, a plain frontal projection. So all portions of the RV are seen on this projection. Uh, something uh, sometimes we use a, 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 a small kind of caudal or cranial tilt uh, to see the uh, pulmonary valve a little better. This is the lateral that we talked about. It's the same patient. So you can see here more clearly that uh, muscle band in the uh, RV. So this is a patient with a DC RV. Okay, uh, but uh, more importantly, the projection here is lateral, plain lateral. You see, this is the spine. This is the cardiac silhouette. There is no superimposition. This, uh, the cardiac silhouette is separate from the spine. So this is lateral or left lateral. Uh, and it shows clearly the right ventricular apex, the uh, RVOT, and the pulmonary valve. Uh, and you can see the pathology, which is a, a muscle uh, band make, uh, making or uh, dividing this RV into two chambers. Okay. So what projection is this? What projection, this one, the, the top right-hand corner, what projection is this? Quick answer. We don't have too much time. Right, correct. Not only LAO, but also? Cranium. So this is probably some, yeah, shallow LAO cranial I will accept. Uh, so there's an uh, injection into the right ventricle. 
Um, and essentially, this is a pro projection that uh, is sometimes used to look at not only the right ventricular outflow tract, uh, but also the pulmonary artery. Um, so uh, this can open up the left pulmonary artery. You can see there the, the left pulmonary artery uh, on that projection. So when you're trying to get to do one angiogram and get more than one piece of information, uh, this may be useful. In fact, the RPA is also reasonably well profiled. Uh, what is happening here that is not normal? What is filling that normally should not fill with a right ventricular angiogram? Correct. So uh, implying that there is a, a ventricular septal defect, right? So uh, this patient has a, a ventricular septal defect, but if, if this was a normal heart, you would see just the RV, uh, the RVOT pulmonary valve, and with this LAO cranial, you have actually in this patient opened up the uh, branch pulmonary arteries uh, reasonably. Although you can't see the origins exactly, uh, you can see the vessels uh, reasonably well and there is brisk filling. Okay. Uh, the other point that one should emphasize is, although the, there are some recommendations about projections, each patient is individual, and uh, you know the projections have to be customized to suit the patient. Okay. So now we have gone through the right ventricle. We, talk, we talked about how we can use either the lateral view or uh, something like um, you know an anterior oblique view. Oh no! It says my battery will die out. Okay, so an, uh, an anterior oblique view, uh, which is either an uh, LAO with cranial, an RAO view can also be used. So the RV is something that you can image from multiple views. And that is kind of similar to the aortic valve as well. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, an LV angiogram, uh, but it is, uh, you know, put in here to tell you what the aortic valve looks like, uh, what projection is this. Correct. So this is the... RAO projection. So this is an RAO projection of the aortic valve. What is this projection that I'm just uh, highlighting now? Bottom right-hand corner. Lateral, very good. What about this one? What is this projection? This is lateral or left lateral. Yeah, this looks like, a, a, you know, LAO definitely with cranial. There is a, a superimposition and elevation of that diaphragm, okay? Um, there are some pathological findings on this, uh, on this angiogram. Can anybody spot what is going on? So these two are the same patients. Yeah. So one thing is that the catheter is quite low. It isn't the aortic cusp, okay? So uh, assessment of AR is actually quite um, uh, faulty when you have the catheter uh, so far down into the aortic cusp. Uh, so a little difficult to comment on the AR, but there is AR. The other thing you notice is that if you look at the profile of the ventricular septum and you look at the profile of the aortic cusp, there appears to be some form of prolapse of that aortic cusp. So, uh, you know, this could well be a patient with a, a, a VSD with aortic valve prolapse and you're not outlining the VSD very clearly, or maybe there is some aneurysm of that uh, cusp. So this angiogram does not very clearly give you that information, but definitely the uh, anatomy or the morphology of that uh, uh, aortic cusp is not normal. And there is definitely AR, which may be catheter induced. So you have to pull the catheter back and do an angiogram uh, to uh, determine whether this is pathological AR, okay? Now, I want you to look at these two angiograms. There is no subvalvar AS here, okay? The, if I want you to look at these two angiograms, so I'll just stop the others. Okay, the two angiograms that are playing, so these are both in LAO and cranial, okay? So, uh, of the two angiograms, which is steeper LAO? Is it this one? The one to the, we'll call this the one to the right, and we call this the one to the left, okay? Which one is steeper LAO? The one to the right? Correct. So you can see the difference, can't you? On this image, you can nicely see that this is more steep, the LAO, 
the same patient. Uh, it, so the cardiac silhouette superimposes on the spine less, so it's moved or shifted more. The IVS is lengthened more. There is, of course, a cranial angulation. This is more shallow LAO, maybe 30 degrees LAO. This may be, I don't know, closer to 60 degrees LAO. You can see how that IVS changes. It's a very nice comparison of the, the difference in the profile of the interventricular septum depending on how steep the LAO is, okay? Okay, and this is just plain frontal projection. So this is the aortic valve that has been imaged in various projections. This is just plain frontal. Uh, this is RAO, lateral, steep LAO, and mid LAO. Okay, so just to give you an idea as to what the aortic valve, and here because of the AR, we are able to get a profile of the LV as well uh, in the various projections. And this patient has got aortic valve uh, prolapse related to a VFT. Okay, so now we finish the iota. We go on to the pulmonary arteries. These are, uh, as you know, uh, notoriously uh, difficult to uh, image. So here we have a patient in whom uh, there is an injection being made in the main pulmonary artery. This is in a plain frontal view, okay? Uh, so with viewing pulmonary arteries, it's not only about angulation, but it's also about techniques. Uh, so here, uh, an injection has been made into the MPA. The MPA is aneurysmal, so it, it covers up the PA origins or it superimposes on the PA origins and you can't clearly see what is going on uh, in the branch pulmonary artery. So in this second angiogram, what the operator has done is gone more distally, okay? So we, uh, we have gone more distally across beyond that aneurysm and now you can clearly see that there is significant stenosis uh, more in the uh, right pulmonary artery origin, okay? And this will need some form of intervention, maybe a stent. But uh, this just demonstrates we are not changing the projection, but what we have done is change the technique. So we have gone distal to the aneurysmal pulmonary artery and injected, okay? Okay, so uh, this is a, once again, this is to demonstrate the branch pulmonary arteries. Uh, here, uh, there is a, a right anterior oblique projection that has been used. So this is a, a, a pulmonary angiogram in RAO. So what the RAO projection often does is it opens up the right pulmonary artery very nicely. So you can see that the RPA is well seen. Uh, the entire length of the RPA is well seen, okay? But if you look at the LPA in this projection, the LPA origin is not very clearly seen. Although distal vessels are seen, LPA origin is not very clearly seen. This is the same patient. Now, this patient has got an uh, LAO tilt. Now, the initial angiogram is with RAO. The second angiogram is with LAO and a bit of cranial. You can see that the uh, diaphragm is elevated. Uh, and in this angiogram, the second one, you can see compared to the first one that the LPA origin is much better delineated. So just if we wait, let me just uh, freeze this at the right frame. Okay, so this is this is what you could see of the LPA. Okay, now you see. Uh, this is this is in an RAO projection. The RPA is clearly uh, lengthened out, and you can see the entire length of it. But the LPA you can't really see very well. And here, this is in an LAO projection. You see how the LPA has been clearly opened out. Um, so these are two orthogonal projections that you can use. Here, there is also cranial because the diaphragm is elevated. Okay. So the smart ones among you, what have you noticed? What is the pathology here? What is going on here? We have to answer quickly because we have a few more slides to go. Uh, no, this patient actually uh, has got anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Can, can you see that in the levo phase, the veins are coming together, forming a vertical vein? So this is the, uh, this is the pulmonary artery angiogram. And then you have the 
the venous phase. The veins coming together, vertical vein, and then draining into the uh, HVC. Okay, so um, the exact point of drainage, not uh, it's into the innominate actually, into the innominate, and then the HVC. Okay, so uh, this is a patient with TAPVC. So we talked about the projection. And here, uh, you know, the importance of selective angiography. So if you inject it into the uh, MDA, um, you know, you may not get a very clear idea as to the, the exact nature of the individual pulmonary artery. So uh, sometimes it is useful to enter each of the individual pulmonary arteries. Here you can see the RPA is small and hypoplastic, and the LPA is uh, annual. So we have not done anything with the projection here. We have just used a, uh, a technique. The other way of delineating pulmonary arteries is by using a pulmonary venous wedge angiogram. Okay, so uh, here I, we have entered the pulmonary vein, wedged our catheter, and then injected. Often uh, you, we can use layered contrast, or you use a small amount of contrast and then some uh, saline or over it layering, uh, so that it allows the contrast to flow through more freely through the pulmonary capillary bed. So here you can see this is in the, into the capillary uh, bed, and you see a backward filling of the right pulmonary artery. Okay, and the entire uh, you know pulmonary tree gets filled. This is often a technique that we use in pulmonary atresia. Uh, this patient has a boot-shaped heart, and uh, this patient uh, most likely has pulmonary atresia. Okay, so the other uh, position you can inject into is the PDA. So these are the various ways you can highlight a pulmonary artery, okay? So you can inject into a PDA. <clears throat> this patient also has pulmonary atresia. You can see an RV injection and a simultaneous injection into the PDA. So the PA is actually, if I can get it to play, PA is actually, uh, hmm, for some reason, it's uh, creating some difficulties. But I hope you caught it when it uh, finished. Okay. Uh, so the PA is actually filling through the PDA. Um, so this is another way to visualize pulmonary artery. Okay, next we move, move on to the PDA itself. Uh, often we need uh, angiographic images of the PDA when we are intending to close the PDA. What is the common view that we use in the lab? What is the common view that we use in the lab? Quick counsels, please. Lateral, correct. That's our most common. Sometimes when it's not very clear on the lateral, REO, correct. So this is a just a view, uh, just a simple lateral view. And here we have entered the PDA and we are in, uh, injecting into the iota without arterial access, this technique. This is REO, okay? The REO shows the uh, ampulla much better uh, and sometimes can be a useful guide when uh, the lateral does not give enough information. Occasionally you can go... Uh, you know, further LAO on the lateral. So you go 100 degrees LAO. Uh, sometimes when both of these views, the lateral and the RAO are not clear enough, that 100 degrees LAO can help. Okay. So this is, uh, obviously, we not only close PDAs, we also open PDAs. So there's a PDA stenting procedure. Uh, this gives you a demonstration of two procedures, interventional procedures, one to open the PDA uh, in a patient with pulmonary atresia, uh, and the other is uh, to close the PDA in a patient with a persistent uh, ductus arteriosus. Okay, so I had some questions at the end, uh, which I thought I would run through quickly. So you have to answer very quickly. What is the sign called? Only three or four questions, and then we are done. What is the sign called? Quick, quick, quick. What sign are we demonstrating here? I'll give you a clue. I'm pointing my, my pointer at it. No answers. So here we are actually injecting into a collateral. This is a pulmonary atresia with MAPCAS patient injecting into a collateral and it is backfilling into the pulmonary arteries. And this is a seagull sign, right? 
you guys have gone to sleep okay so let's hope this angiogram plays hmm okay not really happening okay where is this catheter placed where is the position of this catheter Where is the position of this catheter? Which chamber? You think it's the coronary sinus. Okay. Uh, actually, this is meant to play and it's a little clearer when it plays. But essentially, the dye just stays there. It doesn't move. Okay. So, uh, that is the clue. So, uh, uh, the finding when you play this angiogram is that the dye just stays 